Um, so I'll start by saying welcome to the seminar series and thanks for coming. Um, today, Levi uh, Brian, professor of philosophy at Collin College, is going to give a talk called Texts Are a Factory. Um, I'll just quickly say things about Levi, things about the seminar series, and then we'll get started. Uh, things about Levi. Um, I first came across his work about 10 years ago um, browsing the internet, and I came across a paper on Deleuze's aesthetics, and you could only get to it through Google's cache. Um, but it was brilliant. And, and, and it was brilliant in a way that Levi's work um, tends to be, in the sense that it's, um, it's simultaneously rigorous. Some coffee? Are you serious? I'm sorry. I'm back. I was saying your work was brilliant. Yeah, I had to run away. I was watching. <laughs> And I was specifying what I meant by brilliant, namely rigorous, in the sense that he's a very, like he's one of the, the very good readers of Deleuze's work, um, but also adventurous. Um, and, and, and usually those two don't go together in the same thought, to be simultaneously rigorous or adventurous, but I think the best readings are. Um, uh, and his aesthetics paper certainly uh, fulfilled those criteria, and his first book on Deleuze, Difference and Givenness, which came out with Northwestern, in 2008, just extends that. It's, it's brilliant, and it's hands down one of the best books out there on Deleuze. Um, he's, he's known more recently for his work in object-oriented ontology, and especially on his blog, Larval Subjects, um, in which he basically develops a non-Heideggerian form of object-oriented ontology. Um, and it takes on its fullest expression in a book just published online that's not out yet in print called The Democracy of Objects with Open Humanities Press, right? Is that yeah. Yep, Open Humanities. Um, so, um, so that's what I know about Levi. Um, what you should know about this conference is that this is our second talk in the seminar series. Um, and one of the things we're doing here is just experimenting with the genre of what we've called the Skype and art. Um, and we had a more formal talk last time. Um, this time, Levi is going to do a more exploratory talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and then open the floor to, to questions about um, the two readings for today and anything else as long as it's not personal. Uh, is, that, is that about right? That sounds about right. Excellent. So, you know, please welcome Levi Bryant. Right, so I, I wanted to uh, you know, begin by thanking all of you for having me here and uh, making this possible. Um, you know, I was uh, surprised to find out about this uh, Skype and our series on uh, rhetorical bodies because it uh, fits very much into some of the work that I'm doing right now as well, and so it uh, you know was a nice uh, bit of convergence there. And so, <clears throat> you know, as, uh, as Joe mentioned, my. Uh, my uh, most recent book, The Democracy of Objects, it argues that uh, all of being, all of existence, uh, or uh, all of uh, the universe is composed of objects, that is, discrete entities that uh, are irreducible to other entities and that have their own, uh, own agency. And so these objects, often we uh, think about objects as uh, being rather boring and uninteresting things that just sit there, but uh, it's important to, to understand that within my framework, these objects, they're processes. They are dynamic systems that uh, are constantly moving even when they appear to sit still. And so when it comes to uh, things pertaining to the symbolic, to the universe of language, to rhetoric, to things such as money, and so on and so forth, I find myself in an interesting position. Uh, you know, I have to account for the nature of these entities. Where do they fit into this ontology? And so, is, uh, is something like a text something that simply exists in the human mind? Uh, it's such that it has no reality of its own. I certainly don't want to argue that. Uh, or, right, uh, are things such as language and signs and so on, are they objects, are they entities in their own right? And this is what I want to argue. And there's some, some reasons for that, right? Uh, 
that uh, we should grant reality to symbolic entities, that we should treat them as real things. So some of those reasons would be that that, uh, <coughs> that uh, these uh, these entities they're not reducible to any particular person or individual, right? Uh, and so, for example, when we talk about uh, the meaning of a word, right? Uh, the meaning of a word, it couldn't exist if human minds didn't exist, but then by the same token, right, uh, it seems to be up to no particular individual in order to exist. It seems to have some sort of reality in its own right, in much the same way that, that uh, my iPhone or my computer here or rock has a reality in uh, its own right. And so it seems that within the world, we have three types of entities. We have uh, physical or material objects, such as rocks and bones and so on and so forth. Uh, we have uh, humans, we have minds, right, which would be, I suppose, uh, one class of physical objects. And then we have this additional class of objects. We have symbolic entities, things like text, things like words, meanings, money, and so on and so forth. And uh, these things are irreducible to minds. They seem to have some sort of reality of their own that uh, can't be reduced merely to individual human minds. And so how are we to think about that is uh, one of the questions that I'm asking myself here uh, with these types of issues. And so <clears throat> this brings me to the issue of fictions, right? Uh, and why would I be particularly interested in fictions in this connection? Uh, because it seems to me that the fictional is the limit case of the symbolic, right? Uh, that, um, you know, we have a tendency when we talk about entities that have meaning to them to want to look at their reference, right? We think of, uh, of uh, words, we think of signifiers as uh, somehow corresponding to or representing another reality. And so I say, you know, the snow is white, and I immediately want to think about the reference of that proposition, the snow is white, uh, namely the real snow that's out there in the world. And so I have a tendency to ignore the, uh, the status of the proposition itself as a real entity and instead pass through to its reference. And so the advantage that I get by focusing on fictions is that they have no reference, right, uh, out there in the world. And so this allows me to think the properties of the symbolic, this allows me to think the properties of symbolic entities in their purity, in their sheer materiality as real entities. And so they provide a sort of limit case that would be common, I think, to all symbolic entities. And so what I want to do is I, is I address these, uh, these issues of the, of the fictional and of the symbolic. What I'm trying to do, and it's still very much in the provisional stage, is I'm trying to emphasize, right? I'm trying to, uh, to think the fangliness of fictions, their status as things. In other words, you know, if we talk about something like Moby Dick, or if we talk about something like the Old Testament, right? Uh, these texts, they aren't simply about something, right? They're not simply about meaning that refers to the world in some way or another. They are something. And so what interests me here is what are the philosophical, the rhetorical, the communicative uh, implications of recognizing this very, very simple, very obvious and almost facile uh, point that these entities are something. They are truly and really existing material entities out there in the world that, uh, that have their own existence in their own right. Uh, as you uh, seem to be saying in your seminar series, they are, uh, they are, right, rhetorical bodies. And so what does it mean to think about instances of speech, literary text, film, and so on, as bodies that circulate out there in the world? And so one of the things that I try to do initially is I try to, uh, to bracket or to reject uh, the dimension of meaning in these rhetorical bodies. Uh, to set that aside, not because texts aren't meaningful, right, but because I want to emphasize the material dimension of these texts. And this allows me to begin thinking about texts in very, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, Darwinian 
kind of ways, right? Uh, you know, I think that we have a tendency when we think about uh, when we have ideas, right? You know, if I read Deleuze and Guattari, for example, um, and uh, I come to understand their philosophy, uh, I, I think that that meaning that I've discovered in their philosophy pervades the entire world. I comprehend the entire world in that sort of way. But if I adopt this from a slightly different perspective, if I emphasize the thingliness of their text, A Thousand Plateaus, and that it is a material entity, what is one of the things that I immediately begin to notice? That uh, I begin to notice that this text, in order to produce effects of meaning, this text, in order to do things, has to circulate throughout the world. Right? It has to move throughout the world. It has to flow throughout the world. In other words, it has to pass from brain to brain to brain to brain. Uh, it, that meaning isn't something that automatically pervades the entire world. And so this is what it means, I, I'm saying, to think about the text in somewhat Darwinian terms, that there has to be a population formed for these ideas to be transmitted throughout the world. And so suddenly, right, uh, we are being brought before all sorts of issues that often, in, uh, I think, in literary criticism and uh, rhetorical analysis and so on, that we don't necessarily uh, begin to uh, think about or often think about uh, unless we're deeply influenced by people like uh, Kittler and Long and uh, McLuhan and so on. Uh, we're brought before all these issues that might seem to be second to rhetoric and uh, literary analysis, things that have to do with how texts disseminate, how texts uh, travel throughout the world, and uh, their modes of connectivity as they do travel throughout the world. And so we're going to be thinking about media technologies and how they transmit texts, how uh, we're, we're going to be thinking about issues of uh, access to texts. For example, if we talk about academic journals, uh, whether or not uh, these academic journals uh, in their materiality occur in paper form and uh, are only available in university libraries and how expensive they are, whether or not they're in open access form. Uh, we would uh, have to think about um, you know, whether or not a particular text is able to resonate within uh, a particular community of speakers. And so there seems to be ways in which uh, collectives of people and communities of people form uh, immune systems, right, to certain ideas, to certain instances of uh, rhetoric to prevent those from being able to, uh, to function. All right, we're going to think about, uh, well, I'm trying to think about text very much in a material sense of dissemination and how can they travel throughout the world so as to affect other bodies. And, uh, you know, why might this be important? Why might this be an important issue? is uh, because certainly, you know, for those of us who do social and political theory, right, uh, there are a number of, of, of ideas, there are a number of concepts, there are a number of arguments that we would like to be able to make to the public, that we would like to, uh, to get out there, yet it seems that for whatever reason, it's very difficult for some of these things to disseminate. What is that? And so if we can understand these networks, if we can understand these uh, assemblages that allow texts to, uh, to circulate throughout the world and that prevents certain texts from circulating throughout the world. If we can understand why some texts are successful and some texts are not successful, perhaps then we can begin to devise strategies that uh, would uh, allow us to broaden the dissemination of those types of ideas. And so this would be part of what it means to focus on the text as a factory rather than as a theater. Right? Deleuze and Guattari, they have this, uh, this famous distinction in anti-Oedipus between the factory and, uh, and the theater. Uh, the theater is representation, right? In the theater, we're looking at uh, the text as meaning. What, uh, how can we decode the text? What does the text mean? How does it signify? Uh, we might look at uh, instances of um, <clears throat> of uh, persuasion, what is the structure of persuasion and so on, so propositional content and proper relations between statements as well as uh, ethos and pathos uh, and all of these sorts of things. But to look at the text as a factory, 
is to bracket this issue of meaning, to bracket this dimension of uh, meaning, and to begin to look at what texts actually do as they travel throughout the world. How can they affect readers? How can they affect different communities? And how do they pull together particular groups of people? Those would be the sorts of issues that uh, we would be uh, looking at or that I'm trying to think about. And so I, you know, I'll leave it uh, there for the moment, and maybe uh, we, we could have a little bit of a uh, talk so you could help me to think about these kinds of issues and go from there. Excellent. Thanks, Levi. Um, I think everybody's still awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll start with the first question to buy everybody a little time. Um, I don't get what you're bracketing meaning, uh, be, because that seems potentially really interesting. You know, to say, for example, that um, uh, I can fall in love with a fictional character, right? Uh, yes. But wouldn't that thing that I fall in love with be a certain assemblage of meanings with which the text produces? And then by bracketing that particular fictional thing, which actually acted on me, and you know, took my affections away with it, uh, wouldn't that also constitute an actor? <laughs> <laughs> you got lucky, Brian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not. But when I say bracketing meaning, uh, you know, this this sort of Husserlian move. Uh, that, that you're talking about here. I'm certainly not uh, t suggesting that meaning should be rejected or that meaning is not uh, a phenomenon that exists out there in the world. Right? Uh, you know, what, what I'm suggesting when I talk about bracketing meaning is that you know, right now at this particular point and, and for quite a while uh, in, in literary theory and literary criticism and these sorts of things, we have, we have focused, I think, I believe, uh, as well as an ideology critique, on the uh, the decoding of cultural artifacts, right? And uh, you know, as far as the, the structure of consciousness or intentionality that's involved in that sort of activity, that's going to lead us to relate to these texts in a very particular way. And so, you know, what I'm suggesting when I say, you know, let's bracket meaning, right? Uh, is let's let's set aside for a moment. This, uh, this activity of, of decoding or of ideological critique, and let's instead look at the materiality of the text, the thingliness of the text, and examine how it circulates throughout the world as a material thing, how it jumps from mind to mind to mind to mind. Right? And so why is it that at, at certain times and places, something like um, you know, the, uh, the rights of man for example, during the French Revolution, why is it that somehow this material assemblage of, of words is suddenly able to resonate in this particular context, whereas in another context, it's not able, you know, these ideas that existed for a long time are, you know, uh, they're very down, right? They don't travel throughout the world very much. They don't move from mind to mind very much. And we have to set aside for the moment, I think, the uh, the issue of meaning and decoding in order to be able to pose those sorts of questions. Does that make sense? Or yeah, and I think the other thing that's potential, the other distinction that might be uh, I might be mixing up here is the dis like the distinction between the materiality of the text and, uh -huh. and something like the book. Do you, like, do you distinguish between the two? Um, between you know this thing that I can buy at the store and make marks in, uh, underline and all this kind of stuff, and then there's this thing that you're calling the materiality of the text, or do you align materiality of the text and the book? Well, I mean, how do you distinguish the two? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I thought you were doing the distinguishing, but <laughs> but what I thought you might be doing. Is, is saying, you know, the rights of man isn't limited to any particular instantiation or publication of that book or of that text in, the, in this or that book, but is instead uh -huh. a set of representations that aren't reducible to uh, any given text. 
Does that make sense? Does anybody know what I'm saying better than I do? You guys think of it as a paradigm. Yeah. Pardon? Oh, I guess the distinction between something like Jeanette's paradigm, where the book is, or the text is contained in a set of a, a cover and a back cover, and, you know, a dedication and acknowledgments and all those things that sort of surround the text. And mm. I guess just history of the book in general. Yeah. Yeah, like that, that assemblage of things that aren't the ideas that you call from the text. Suddenly my vocabulary is fit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Friday. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't think I draw the, uh, the distinction that you're asking me about. I mean, as, as a materialist, uh, you know, my position is going to be that there has to be some sort of material inscription in order for a text to exist. Now that material inscription, it could be in any variety of, uh, of mediums, it could be in neon lights, it could be on paper, uh, it could be uh, voice, right, traveling through the air, um, it could be uh, lodged in brains, right, remember we, uh, we used to memorize uh, the Homeric poems, they weren't originally written down. Uh, but it has to be materially inscribed in some way in order to be able to produce effects out there in the world. And so that's, that's one of those key points there, right? Uh, that you know, anything that's material gets located in a time and in a place. And so when I talk about this in, in Darwinian terms, right, one, one of the points I'm making is that uh, the, these texts, they have to propagate themselves throughout the world. And so, you know, where if we were talking in uh, platonic terms, the form of the triangle exists for all eternity in this heavenly world of the forms uh, and always has these sorts of features, in these kind of materialist terms, an idea, it has to, it has to pass throughout the world from person to person to person, from culture to culture to culture, in order to exist. It has to trace a route throughout uh, the world in order for it to be able to produce effects. And uh, one way it could do that is electronically. Another way that it could do that would be in paper. That paper can decay. It can be destroyed. Uh, there can be all sorts of random variation that takes place as things get copied, as was the case during the Middle Ages when you know they would uh, you know, copy various uh, manuscripts of the Greek philosophers and so on and, uh, and so forth. Um, but you know, I think emphasizing this, this materiality of the text allows us to, to ask uh, certain questions that might not immediately be so obvious from the, uh, the point of view of uh, maybe some uh, more traditional uh, forms of uh, criticism and ideology critique. And so, for example, if we look at Occupy Wall Street that's unfolding right now, Right. Um, you know, they are uh, engaging in various forms of speech act. Uh, they are producing various texts. But uh, we also notice that uh, those texts don't seem to be traveling throughout the world uh, in, uh, in the way that, uh, especially the media system, uh, in the way that initially we might like them to be able to travel throughout the world. Now, traditional ideology critique would say something like, and, and they would have some truth to it, right? That, um, that uh, ideology, you know, a set of uh, ideological distortions and beliefs are just, uh, you know, leading the media to, uh, to not uh, transmit these particular ideas. And certainly that's part of the story. But, you know, another part of the story is going to have to do things with, you know, just simple pathways of communication. Are the pathways of communication there? for these various texts, for these various claims to disseminate throughout the world beyond the protests themselves. And in this case, we might uh, devise strategies, right, to enhance the ability of that transmittability. Thank you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, I have a question that I think is partly due to my own confusion, but I'm hoping you can help me out. Um, at the opening of your talk, you mentioned discrete objects. I'm, yes. I'm wondering how much weight we're putting on that, dis that situation of discreteness, because I see one problem and one complication associated with 
Um, yeah. Is it the case then, uh, when we get into a situation where we're dealing with multiplicities, that networks are also considered as discrete objects? Um, and how, how would we parse something like that if the network is consistent, is, is built out of other discrete objects? And then <clears throat> the problem is, in the course of dissemination, what about in instances where uh, an object is disseminated partially? Where the, the act of dissemination itself troubles this notion of discreteness. Um, and then, you know, is, is the remnant that is, dis, that is disseminated still that object? Is that route still traceable, or are we dealing with something new? Oh, I, mean, I, I think we would be dealing with something new. I mean, for me, all objects are composed of other objects. Right, and so you get objects at a variety of different levels of scale, uh, and uh, all of those objects are discrete. And so, for me, a cell in my body, for example, is no less uh, an object than uh, the the entirety of my body itself, and an entire city would be uh, an object as well. And so, you know, we could get into, I think, with which is what uh, you're getting at here, we could get into uh, all sorts of interesting issues about citation. Is that what you're pointing to a little bit? Where, you know, say a portion of a text is transmitted, but not uh, not the entire text. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly know that um, there are all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, interesting movements in poet poetry, right, that make use of this very phenomenon, the ability to, to chunk out sentences and, uh, you know, elements of text to form something new, right, sometimes called uh, writing through or, uh, you know, what, what are some of the other poetic movements, uh, you know, where they actually use spam from the internet to, uh, to compose poems you know, and stuff like that. And so, you know, just as, you know, to go to Deleuze uh, and Guattari's famous uh, discussions about the way in which viruses can sometimes pick up strands of DNA and carry them to other species, leading to evolutionary processes to take place, you know, something similar can take place at the level of text where uh, elements can be pulled out, units can be pulled out, and they can begin to circulate throughout the world on their own. And in fact, you know, I, I think uh, Joe would agree with me here. I mean, this is... Uh, some of our frustration with uh, Deleuze and Guattari scholarship, right, Joe? Uh, that um, that the, the nature of it, uh, citational discourse, Deleuze and Guattari get reduced to a few famous uh, quotes or passages, right? Things about the rhizome, the orchid and the wasp, and so on and so forth. And uh, in, in, in a lot of respects, that is that citational discourse is a very different Deleuze and Guattari than the sort of Deleuze and Guattari that uh, you know, we might find in the texts themselves. And we end up talking about that sort of shadowy double of the text of these key citations that everybody repeats, right, rather than what's there in the text. Um, just this one quick follow-up. If, if um, the category of things that can be objects seems to be awfully huge, um, yes. How then do we distinguish one object from another? How do we distinguish one object from another? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, that's that's kind of a question. Like, when does a pile become a heap? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, there there are going to be fuzzy lines here, and uh, you know, certainly there would be things that I think are quasi objects that maybe not, aren't quite objects yet. At, uh, at a particular point, but I, I think that there has to be some sort of systematic closure in a, a network, right, uh, and uh, continuity in time and space before something can begin to qualify as an object. Yeah. I mean, what, what motivates um, my question there is if we're dealing with something like the text as an object and we're trying to, uh -huh. to trace its movement from mind to mind to mind, like, how do I, you know, how do I figure out that the text is still the object that I'm tracing and not some part of it or some other object of which that text is a part? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Right? I, I mean, I, I mean, I think that might be one of the interesting issues, though. Right? Uh, you know, if we if we wanted to approach, uh, say, the study of the Bible in these sorts of terms. Um, 
you know, when I look at the history of Christianity, uh, it seems to me that I find a lot of beliefs within Christianity that I would be I would be hard put to find anywhere in the Bible, right? You know, especially a lot of ideas about heaven and hell and so on that seem to come more from Dante than uh, than they they seem to come from the Bible and uh, you know these sorts of things. And so right there, so I, we. We've got to keep in mind here that we're talking about distinct objects, right? On the one hand, we have the Bible, and then we have all the different translations of the Bible, which are distinct objects. And then we have the way in which different objects are apprehending or relating to that object, namely the brains that it's passing through in this situation. And, you know, a lot of times uh, we, we pick up objects in very partial ways, and uh, we're, we're not interested in all aspects of the particular object. We don't encounter all aspects of the particular object. This is one of the reasons that uh, us object-oriented ontologists say that objects are withdrawn. We encounter them in very specific ways. And so, you know, I had, I had uh, asked you to read about, uh, you know, Jane Bennett passages on uh, problems of political ecologies as well as uh, my article uh, on the ethics without arche. And, uh, you know, a, a text like the Bible, it plays a role in the genesis of a new object, right? This, namely, this particular community, whether it's the Baptist community or the Lutheran community or something like that, right? It's played a role in the genesis of a larger scale object, that community of people, right? But certainly not everything from the Bible has, has been retained within that community. There's an evolution that begins to take place within that community itself that has only selectively taken things out of this particular text. Right? It might ignore the Sermon on the Mount altogether, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Does that respond at all to? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's the, the, I mean, I'm, I'm very fascinated by the, by the, the whole uh, move. I just, I keep running into a sense of anxiety about, um, these points of indecidability between one object and another, um, wow. and I was—I didn't know if there was like a a, a a good like established strategy for helping to mitigate my anxiety, or if I just need to be anxious about it. <laughs> no, I mean I think it's an empirical question. I, I think we could be mistaken, right? And uh, you know, so just as uh, in, in certain cases, um, we might think that say it. Uh, it, it, it's it's a single entity that is causing a particular thing, right? So our sciences might proceed on on uh, the idea that maybe language is localized in one single region of the brain, our ability to use language, and so they, you know, much to the dismay of uh, you know, their their test subjects, they cut away and they explore that particular portion of the person's brain and so on. Um, but uh, you know they might subsequently end up finding that uh, you know what they thought was a single thing or a single object is in fact right a, you know a highly distributed multiplicity of different things and so you know there, I, I just don't think that there's any a priori answer that we can give to that question right we have to actually investigate these things and determine whether or not uh, closure. Uh, does in fact exist or not? So if we can go back to the example of the city, right, we might very well discover, you know, just as um, <clears throat> as uh, China Mieville has uh, taught us in the city and the city, right, that uh, what we take to be a single discrete object is actually two or three different objects, just because they're located in the same geographical place, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that um, Paris is a single city just because we have a single name for it because there might be sub communities in there that are just completely you know for whatever reason isolated from other elements of the city and are evolving at their own rate and, and function in their own sort of way and so you know I, I think you're asking a really good question here right uh, you, you seem to be asking a kind of question about uh, maybe the language as well. Does the fact that we have a name for something like Paris entail that there's a single discrete object there? And you know, as an object-oriented ontologist, I would say, well, no, we've got to be careful about that, right? Just because we call it a single thing doesn't necessarily mean that it is, 
uh, a, a single thing, right? There has to be some sort of connectivity there within the system, forming a network that's formed a system. And uh, you know, so I might say, you know, if we if we take uh, Delanda's point of view um, <clears throat> about the formation of biological species, right? Uh, you know, we might say, oh, right, uh, that. Uh, there is a species called cows, and I encounter cows over here in China, and I encounter cows over here in the United States, and they're the same species, uh, and that species is an individual entity. But we might find, and I say we might, we might find uh, ontological reasons to question that because there's no sort of relationship between individuals in these two geographical locations, and you know they are, you know, these are splitting, evolving trajectories. Right, uh, that might uh, give us good reason to suggest no, these are actually distinct entities that we're talking about in this case, even though they seem to resemble one another. It's a hard question. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, uh, yeah I, I don't think that you can see me, but can you yeah. hear me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, yes, I have a question. You um, spoke about sheer. And so what this entails is that every object caricatures, right, every other object. And so, uh, you know, there is uh, very much, I think, the possibility of integrating um, uh, Adorno's non-identity thought here and, you know, pointing to the sorts of things that, uh, that he's concerned with, where we confuse the object with our concept of the object, right? And we're never quite able to get to the object itself, right? We're always working with that caricature of what the object is. But, right, you know, part of this, you know, this ethical imperative, which I am very, very sympathetic to, right, is the recognition of that sort of fact. And so, you know, if we look at a lot of, um, of queer criticism in recent years and of feminist criticism and, and, and so on and so forth and social and political thought, you know, one of the points that they, they, they've constantly made is that um, you know, often we have these universal concepts of what humanity is, for example, right, and that these concepts, they are caricatures of actual people, right, and that they carry within them a, a sort of ideological baggage that um, presupposes maybe uh, you know, uh, heteronormativity right, without explicitly being aware of it, or that presupposes um, you know, the, the paradigm of the masculine as being what the human is without being aware of doing that and working with those sorts of concepts. And so one of the things when we emphasize the withdrawal of the object, of the, uh, the way in which uh, one object caricatures another object, when we emphasize um, the inability of two objects to ever directly encounter one another, strangely, right now we can begin to pull back these sorts of differences, right, uh, or encounter these sorts of differences that we would like to get at to become aware of them uh, and to avoid these sorts of caricatures. Is that what you were kind of getting at? Yes, yeah, I was wondering indeed uh, what it is, and so you're advocating this awareness of the materiality of things. It's, it's differential nature, yeah. right? It, it's uniqueness, it's singularity, all of these sorts of things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. I think we are pausing up here. All of you are in slow motion all of a sudden. <laughs> I have a question about um, Yes. It's actually just a clarification. You briefly brought up the, the fictional. Um, 
when you began, when you introduced the idea of text and some uh, symbols as one of the three entities you were talking about, you said the fictional is the limit of the symbolic in that it has no real reference. Is that um, how does the the fictional is are all of these texts that you're talking about what you're referring to as the fictional is the fictional a, a category of actual what we think of as a fictional novel, for example, or can you explain what you mean? Yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, fictional could include all sorts of things. It could include mythologies, it could include, you know, uh, ideological distortions, as well as fictional texts, it could be films, you know, whatever uh, we wish to say about that. Um, it, it's just that in the case of the fictional, I think that we encounter the symbolic, right, the, the, the being of the symbolic in its, uh, its purest form. As, uh, as as a type of entity um, that uh, is you know able to produce realities right uh, without being dependent on realities that really exist and so you know one of the things here it's, it's a horrifying thing right I mean we all love uh, you know literary fiction and so on but when we talk about things like mythologies and ideologies we get a little bit more concerned right um, but but these things are things that produce real material effects in the world that organize human bodies in all sorts of ways and uh, you know uh, communities these are real entities right that bring people together in particular ways and um, you know so how, how do we go about thinking about the nature of those entities if uh, you know what's his name did not have the idea of the uh, the fountain of youth, right? Think about the effects of that fictional idea and traveling all over the Americas trying to find the fountain of youth, right? And these fictions have real effects out there in the world. And so, I mean, there are some fictions I would presume that we want to destroy. Do, do you differentiate then uh, between uh, what you're talking about as fiction and any other type of claim? Um, for, for example, I mean, how would you differentiate between a Fiction and uh, I mean, you talk about a lot about Darwin's evolution, which is a, mm -hmm. equally a symbolic thing. But why differentiate between what you're talking about? Of, and that there's no real thing you can point to of saying that is evolution, right? It's still mm -hmm. a symbolic text, the same way as, as a as what we would traditionally call fiction. So why differentiate, or how do you differentiate between you know a scientific claim if we give kind of a naive scientist? reading anything. How would you differentiate them? I would just say they're all claims. I get. I, I just found it interesting. Uh, I, I guess that uh, because someone can make a, a scientific claim of saying I saw something. Um, mm. I do research in ghost stories, so people talk about seeing ghosts, and um, mm. that's a claim as much as writing a fictional story about seeing ghosts or. So I'm, I'm just curious why I make that. Why make that? Well, I mean, you know, think about what we're doing when we do a rhetorical analysis. Uh, when we do uh, you know, a rhetorical analysis or a literary analysis of some sort of text like Darwin's uh, Origin of Species, we, we, we just bracket. We want to encounter it in its symbolic nature, and we begin to look at its rhetoric, how it's constructed, right, uh, its uses of language to persuade and all of these sorts of things we bracketed the dimension of its truth. And so the, in, in order to do this kind of analysis, I think we have to have some sort of concept, some sort of uh, idea of the symbolic in and of itself, of the text taken as a surface, right? You know, this is what Deleuze in The Logic of Sense talks about, uh, the surface of speech, the surface of language and sense. Um, where we are just setting aside for the moment questions of its truth or falsity and instead you know looking at uh, you know it surely is a linguistic entity and you know so the you know the fictional i think just allows us to see what that might be about right um it uh, it brings us before that dimension of things because when we when we read um you know Mieville's uh the city in the city you know, we're not, well, is this place really out there or somewhere? No, I mean, that's not how, how we're approaching that text. And that, that means that we've encountered it purely as a symbolic kind of entity. As for the difference between true statements and, uh, again, fictional statements, you know, I, I, I probably 
wouldn't differ too markedly, you know, from a number of, of traditional epistemologies as to how we sort these things out. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd certainly agree we can't always you know, sort these things out, right? Um, you know, with uh, with ghosts, I guess. Um, you know, in the sciences, it's not just that we see things. It's that a variety of different people are just able to see these things, that uh, these things can be repeated under those same conditions by a plurality of different things. Whereas often, but it's difficult, we have all the new ghost shows now, right? Uh, where, uh, but often in the case of, you know, people saying I had an experience with God or, you know, I encountered ghosts or something like that, it's a purely private experience that uh, can't be encountered, you know, by another person. And so it has a, a very low degree of uh, epistemic force behind it for that reason. So then, but then again, I mean, you know, what is it that's problematic about these shows that complicates these epistemological issues? Uh, it's that you have multiple people, right, that are doing these ghost searches and, uh, you know, seem to be sharing some sort of an experience. So, but it's been, you know, then it seems the way you're differentiating is actually that the symbolic test of the text is something that, uh, or the fictional text, is something that originates maybe with a, you know, as a private experience and then becomes passed along in the, through this kind of uh, material way that you were describing earlier, whereas the, the, the scientific claim that you would say is a public thing. That well, I mean, remember when I talk about, uh, when, when I talk about bracketing, you know, I'm bracketing the referential dimension, I would also be bracketing the dimension of the subject or mind that encounters the text, to encounter the text in its sheer textuality. And so, I mean, you know, these, you know, a text for me is a reality every bit as much as that rock there in my backyard. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, some private experience that then gets externalized in the text. No, I mean, you know, Harry Potter for me is a real physical thing that's out there in the world. Those movies that circulate throughout the world, it's not a private thing at all. How people take it, Right, it's a private matter. Right, but uh, you know the the movie itself is something that circulates around the world every bit as much as um, you know the cold virus that my partner has given me. <laughs> yeah. So. <Thanks. laughs> Andrew. No, no, I, I was I was saying five. Oh, okay. Five, five minutes. Yeah. Last question. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess um, one of my questions has to do with the the, the, the premise of factory. Uh -huh. um, because I, I get the sort of emphasis on production. Um, yeah. But what threw me was in your talk, you were contrasting that with fear. Um, and the sense that, um, I, I, I guess to step back, I would say I wonder if you could expand on that distinction. Um, and what yeah. exactly you see the distinction as being between a theater, which certainly has production happening in it, um, where yeah. actors, like actors, are are um, actually taking up a text and doing things with it, um, right. and why that model seems inadequate in comparison to the factory, which is more about converting um, a series of uh, sort of. Uh, Industrial or other material into um, some other sort of oddly useful object. Great. Yeah, I I, I lost that much too quickly. Uh, you know, the the distinction, as I understand it, between the theater and the factory, what what it's um, what it's getting at. Uh, they they introduce this distinction in the context of how the unconscious is analyzed. Is the unconscious a theater? Is the unconscious a factory? So. And, and what they're they're doing uh, when when they introduce this uh, this distinction is they're critiquing this this kind of model of psychoanalytic practice that is always trying to get back to a past that allegedly really took place for the patient that uh, you know these dreams that I'm having are really uh, theatrical representations of a drama that I lived with my mother and father in the past of my childhood. And what they want to say is that no, you know, it's the, the unconscious, it doesn't represent anything 
it makes something. You know, it's constantly inventing these new ideas, these new affects, these new ways of feeling, these new connections and symbolic things and so on and so forth. It is producing something. And so, you know, if we take that distinction between theater and factory and put it into the domain of, of something like, say, literary criticism, the theater model, we might think about it in terms of new historicism. We try and trace the text back to the historical conditions in which the text was produced and show that Ellison was really talking about you know, uh, the, uh, the emergence of new media and all these sorts of things, uh, that that's what he was really talking about. Or if we're really facile, we talk about author's intention. And uh, you know, if we really want to know what uh, crime and punishment is about, Right, you have to go and talk to Dostoevsky. Right, so always trying to get back to this origin. But if we treat the text as a factory, we say no. Right, you know the text is is something that um, it doesn't have some sort of fixed original meaning in either history or in, uh, in in the author's mind. It is something that is capable of producing all sorts of things in the world around us and you know how and what are these sorts of things that uh, that that text produces what does it make how does it transform the human bodies that it comes in contact with the material bodies of the world that it comes in contact with you know sometimes you'll see documentaries on how star trek and science fiction movies uh, you know led all sorts of engineers to invent technologies because damn it i wanted a tricorder you know and so now i have my tricorder <laughs> Um, and uh, you know, so the thing that I always come back to when I think about the text and, and trying to respect the text, you know, respect the text, is that um, the epic of Gilgamesh, right, uh, still signifies. We don't know a whole lot about you know the author of the epic of Gilgamesh or knowledge of like uh, you know the culture in which the epic of Gilgamesh is written. Is, uh, is is very limited. Yet still, I can pick up the Epic of Gilgamesh, this ancient text, and that can affect me. That can uh, you know, it, it, it can use me as a material in its factory in all sorts of ways that like end up making me live in a different way. And we could all start a reading group, right, of the Epic of Gilgamesh and have all sorts of discussions, and that would form a new collective that would problematize us in certain ways. And I don't know, maybe we become like modern day you know, warrior people or something like that. We could, you know, take over all these themes of the Epic of Gilgamesh in a modern context and see, you know, corporate CEOs as the gods that we have to fight and, uh, you know, develop, like, you know, you get the idea of what I'm talking about here, the way in which the text works on us. And so, you know, I want to emphasize that sort of productive dimension of text, not what is the true meaning or decoding the text in some way or another, but how can texts work on us? How, how can I begin to live my life, you know, as, uh, as a middle-aged college professor, uh, is as the adventure of Harry Potter, or you know, the vampire of Scott, or something like that, uh, you know, kind of phase in which texts work on us, okay. is what I'm thinking about. And, and not, to, not to push, like, on something at the very end of our time, but, um, I, like, it just seems like, well, it just seems like what you're describing is, like, that sort of conjoint action is what yeah. happens when actors take up a script. Um, yeah. And that, um, that like, I, like, I'm, I'm following you at the, the distinction at the level of, like, the psychoanalytic, uh, but when you're, when we get to the point of, like, the text's actual interaction with other agents in the world, that's the point at which it seems like what you're describing, even in your description, um, seems yeah. a lot more like a theater to me, um, and that's and, yeah. the reason, and the reason that the reason I brought that up is because um, theater is the the sort of metaphor that Melcier uses to talk about the way the texts act in the world. Um, that they uh, they did, did. Melcier. Oh, um, Melcier. Yeah. Um, and um, so so it's um, anyway. So yeah, I, that's that's where. Yeah, I think that's entirely fair. I mean, you know, part of it, you know, what, what's important for me is the factory model. And, you know, part of the opposition between, and I'm a huge rock Nasserian myself, but, uh, you know, uh, part of the uh, the theater 
factory distinction is just purely arbitrary coming from Deleuze and Guattari and, you know, what I understand uh, by, you know, what they're doing with the unconscious there and transposing that. So, you know, and if you have suggestions, you know, for a better opposition, right, that gets at this, you know, let's like get away from the origins type thing and instead look at what the texts do and what they produce. And, you know, I really like what you're saying about how the actor, I, this is my Hamlet, you know, this is my Hamlet, and, you know, we got the great um, Leonardo DiCaprio version of Romeo and Juliet and stuff like that, right? How, how the actor or the director translates the material producing something new out of that office charge translation, like a Jacob's Ladder. If you have a better term for that, please, you know, email me about it. And, sure. Yeah. So. Write your own good Thank you, Levi. Uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah. It's been the week from hell, and like I said, my partner is giving me this virus. So, yeah. so. Well, good luck. Thanks. All, All right. right. Thanks for talking. We'll talk soon. Yep. All right. See you.